Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, super excited to be sort of virtually here, but I've actually hoped to be there in person, but, you know, unfortunate logistic issues. But thanks to the organizers for, you know, allowing me to do this remotely. Uh, so, yeah, I think I, you know, work in 3D inference, trying to think about how do we understand the 3D world from images. And sort of today I want to talk to you about sort of a probabilistic approach to that and sort of walk you through maybe a slight change of viewpoint that I've had over the recent few years about sort of from not worrying about probability to thinking about probabilistic modeling as sort of the centerpiece of how we should be doing 3D inference. And, you know, hopefully this at least makes you think about your own approaches if you're not using probabilistic modeling for 3D inference. Um, so yeah, today, again, as the talk says, I'll talk to you about probabilistic uh, 3D inference. And I think before going into my specific work, I kind of want to show you this slide that almost any starting grad student who starts working on 3D vision is more or less shown by their advisor or sees in a lecture, which just tells them that, you know, 3D inference is a hard task. So uh, this is sort of a very classic image from Ted Adelson, where you see this particular image and someone asks you, okay, what's the underlying 3D structure? And, you know, if you're like me, more or less, you're thinking that perhaps this is a piece of paper that has two folds, some different shades, it's lying on something, right? And that's a perfectly reasonable explanation, but sort of the sad news when we are trying to pursue 3D is that there are many, many possible explanations. You know, in fact, there is no one right answer. This could have been a sculpture present in some particular light imaged in a particular direction that could give you this image, or this may just be some artist who is shining lights in a particular way to form this pattern on an image and so on. So, you know, when we are pursuing this task of understanding the 3D world from 2D images, there is this inherent uncertainty, inherent ill-posedness in the task. And to some, in some sense, we need to be able to account for that. But, you know, I think apart from the last few years, this theoretical idea that, you know, 3D is fundamentally uncertain wasn't really there in practice used as much, right? So this is just to give you a very brief history of 3D prediction approaches at least since I became a grad student. So, you know, 3D prediction approaches, which is using neural networks in some way, for instance, to be able to predict 3D. And, you know, I think maybe around 2015, 2016, there were these sort of very cool works from uh, sort of Stanford and CMU, where we saw that, okay, given a few images input, we could train CNNs to predict this volumetric representation of the underlying shape. Um, and then sort of a couple of years, people explored other representations like point clouds um, are here showing some approaches that would predict something like meshes. Um, again, given an image of feed forward neural network that would predict something um, like a reasonable mesh for the underlying object. Um, and you know, more recently we switched from these more explicit representations to implicit and neural field-based representations. Uh, but again, feed forward prediction of this maybe slightly different representation. And what was common in all of these approaches is they didn't really care about uncertainty. So if you looked at this, history of 3D prediction, or at least the initial few approaches that were using neural networks to predict 3D, you know, did not, you would take away that there is no need for modeling probability, uh, you know, modeling underlying distributions, reasoning about uncertainty. And sort of, to be honest, around sort of 2019, 2010, 2020, it was also my view, because if I say, okay, given one image or more images, I want some 3D prediction. Well, I'm happy if you just give me one very amazing looking output. I don't necessarily care about samples, I don't care about modeling distributions, I just want one very, very good output. And, you know, if I just want that, why should I model distributions? Uh, but today I sort of want to tell you why that view was wrong. And in fact, when I look back, I think that we were just not tackling hard enough problems where there was enough uncertainty. And even if you want just one plausible output, you should be sort of tackling the underlying uncertainty, should be modeling the probabilistic distributions. Um, it's just that you know, all the images that you see in this slide, sort of including some of my work, for instance, on bird prediction, it's, you know, you see the side view of that bird, you have basically observed the texture if you assume symmetry, which we did in this work. So there was just very little uncertainty in this sort of bird texture prediction or shape net based chair prediction. And if we move on to maybe more interesting 3D prediction problems, we do will need to make uncertainty modeling a first class citizen. And that's sort of what I hope to convince you about today. Um, and in particular, the problem setup that I've been sort of really inspired by is what I call this Craigslist problem, or you know the eBay problem, not to do eBay or the service, where you have just a few images of an object, let's say this particular monitor, 
and you want you know a high fidelity textured 3D reconstruction of this underlying object from just these handful of images, right? So someone on eBay, Craigslist has taken just two, three images of an object they want to sell. It's sort of a generic object, can be of an object category. They've just casually captured it, haven't really gone around it carefully, captured all aspects. You just have a few images and you want a high quality reconstruction from this, right? And this problem, which sort of tackles this real world reconstruction task for generic objects, you know, has a lot of fundamental uncertainties that really come into play once you sort of focus on subproblems. Uh, just to sort of prime you for a certain, you know, for a couple of aspects where things are really uncertain is if I show you this particular image of a teddy bear and sort of ask you to imagine the underlying 3D object. Well, you know, I've only shown you one aspect of it. I've not shown you all aspects of it. So you can't really answer this question precisely. You know, maybe that particular 3D teddy bear has a black nose in the front or maybe it has a red nose in the front and it's sort of holding a heart or something like that, right? Given just the back view, you don't really know. Uh, you know, it's 3D structure, it's front view is just fundamentally uncertain. Similarly, there's this related task which we'll tackle when we are looking at sort of sparse view 3D inference, which is if I show you two images, what's the relative camera between those two? And if I show you, okay, the synthetic bottle and I ask you what's the relative rotation between the two, well, you might guess 45 degrees, but you know, it's a symmetric object. So it may be minus 45 degrees, it may be 135 degrees or sort of, you know, 225 degrees and so on. So again, just given these two images, the relative configuration between the cameras that correspond to these two is just fundamentally uncertain. And given the evidence, you don't really know the true answer. And when we are tackling this sort of task of sparse view 3D inference, I'd argue that these two sort of settings where there are uncertainties in pose, uncertainties in 3D structure given unobserved regions are just very, very common. And, you know, in fact, I'll talk about these two sub problems for sparse view 3D inference, which is being able to infer pose from sparse views and being able to infer 3D from sparse views. And in both of these, we sort of modeling this underlying distribution is going to be really important. And just to sort of convince you that this direct prediction approach, which I'll sort of define in a bit, but an approach where you, where you don't do probabilistic reasoning, where you just make your neural networks predict some answers doesn't quite work is sort of the black cameras are sort of the true cameras for this particular object, which is, you know, rather sy symmetric and challenging object. And the red cameras are the ones predicted by a system that doesn't care about uncertainty. Um, similarly, if you're given just these two images of a hydrant and are asked to sort of generate a 3D hydrant, this is the, these are the predictions from sort of pixel nerf, which is a direct prediction approach in the sense it doesn't really model uncertainty, it just sort of predicts some structure in a feed forward way. And again, this, you know, doesn't model the details very well, in particular in sort of the regions that are not directly observed in the two views. Okay. And sort of the reason why this happens, why you get wrong pose predictions or very blurry direct predictions is just something to do with, you know, this fundamental behavior that a direct prediction model learns under uncertainty. So when I say direct prediction, what I mean is we have some neural network that takes in an input X, which can be an image, gives you some output Y, which can be a 3D structure or can be a camera pose or something. And we typically just train this by saying, okay, whatever Y you are predicting better match the true Y and we train our neural network this way. And when I said that the problems didn't have enough uncertainty where we saw this, this approach, you know, I'm imagining something like this, that you already see all aspects of the chair and are just uncertain about some tiny details. And, you know, it's a nice distribution where you are almost certain of the mode already and there are just some tiny variations. Now, if you have a direct prediction approach that sees this kind of an X and wants to predict a single Y, you know, it will predict something like this mean, which is a perfectly reasonable output for it to give. But when you start tackling tasks that are sort of truly uncertain, which have, the, which have these multiple modes, like a red nose or a heart versus not a heart, then you encounter these kind of distributions where it's just not a nice Gaussian. And if you have a direct prediction approach, well, again, it will learn to predict the mean and it will give you a rather implausible low probability prediction. And sort of today, the kind of approaches that I want to argue for, for 3D inference and, you know, possibly for a lot of other tasks as well, just say that, okay, instead of a direct prediction approach, let's try to tackle a slightly difficult problem, slightly more difficult problem of modeling the underlying distribution. So given the same input, now we are not outputting a single answer, but we are outputting some sort of a parameterized distribution uh, and are training our neural network to sort of maximize the likelihood of the true data that we have. If you have a mechanism of modeling such distributions, and you still just want a single answer, like, you know, in a lot of my cases, I just care about one good looking 3D reconstruction. Well, 
I don't need a direct prediction model. I can have a probabilistic prediction model and I can then infer a log likelihood mode in that probabilistic prediction model. And this sort of works well in both cases, right? So even if you have a simple Gaussian, it will give you the mode of it. If you have this more complex distribution, assuming you're able to model the underlying distribution and you're able to search for um, you know, the mode of that distribution, you will get sort of a much better answer than what a mean seeking direct prediction approach would do. And sort of, again, this is a bit abstract. I'll try to concretize this a bit more in context of specific problems, but just to give you a preview of the results, we are comparing sort of the direct prediction results for these two problems at the top to sort of probabilistic approaches that I'll talk about in a bit sort of at the bottom, where you can see that, okay, we can now infer much more accurate camera poses for this very symmetric object. And for this hydrant, even though we see the two views where we are not seeing the front, we can hallucinate sort of far more plausible details that you know, just look much more plausible than let's say uh, pixel nerves predictions uh, that you see at the top, right? <clears throat> and I think to begin with, I'll focus a bit on uh, this work where we learn this sort of 3D prediction given sparse view input. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on this first because um, you know this is a chance. You might also get a chance to sort of talk to Z, who is the author who led this work in APR. Um, some static. Okay. Um, you'll hopefully get a chance to see Z at his poster as well. Yeah. Um, so again, just to formalize the goal, we are given a few input images with known camera poses. And then we want to infer sort of a consistent 3D representation of the underlying object. And some of the baselines we'll consider don't necessarily output a 3D representation, but they still output sort of 3D consistent novel views, which is why I'm generalizing the output a bit. Okay. But as I argued earlier, instead of having a feed forward approach where we directly train our network to go from this input to this output, we'll instead, you know, take a detour and learn the distribution of, okay, what's what can this teddy bear look like from the front if I know these two other views? So instead of directly predicting a 3D representation, we'll learn to model the distribution over novel views. And you know, this, these are some kind of results that we can get, for instance, that given these two camera views, which are shown in red, you can get sort of multiple plausible hypotheses for what the teddy bear looks like from the front. Okay. But of course, this doesn't give us a 3D representation. This doesn't give us a consistent 3D. And so as a second step, what we'll do is, um, I think similar to what Christian talked about, so maybe I'll skip on some of the technical details uh, when I describe this, is we try to obtain a single consistent nerve uh, that is sort of highly likely under the distribution that we are modeling. Okay. Uh, so going sort of a bit deeper into the probabilistic view prediction, what we're essentially learning is a neural network that models the distribution over novel views given some input views. And in particular, we sort of leverage a lot of geometric biases in this architecture. So if I'm asking you to generate the sort of purple viewpoint, for each pixel from that viewpoint, we sort of shoot a ray and then project that ray onto sort of many pixels, onto different depths um, given the context views. And then, you know, aggregate features across these different depths and pass them through this epipolar feature transformer, which is sort of heavily inspired by this work that I'm citing below with you know, some modifications. Um, and basically aggregating features along this ray gives us a per pixel feature for the query view. And then given this sort of per pixel feature, we just train a conditional diffusion model, uh, except we don't train this diffusion model in pixel space. We train this in sort of a latent space inspired by stable diffusion. Um, but at the end of the day, we just say, okay, given these features, why? What is the distribution for uh, you know, the view that I might observe? Okay. So we just train a very standard diffusion model, just adding this view condition feature Y as additional conditioning. And we have a sort of diffusion model that can give us plausible novel views from this purple viewpoint, given these other two views, uh, where these other two views are manifested in this feature Y. Okay. And this can give us the generations that we saw earlier. So, you know, just having some geometry inspired design in the conditioning of the diffusion model lets us get sort of pretty reasonable predictions. But apart from that, it's just a very standard way of training conditional diffusion models. <clears throat> but once you've trained this diffusion model, um, <clears throat> we can do something related to what sort of Christian was alluding to earlier, which is model each scene as a nerf, or actually in our case, instant NGP, because it's a bit more efficient. And then just train this instance specific nerve to give you renderings that are likely under this diffusion model that we have learned. So the diffusion model we are learning on lots of training data, then given a couple of images of a new object, we can optimize a per object nerve 
using an objective which just says, okay, the renderings of the nerve should be highly likely. Uh, so in particular, we just sample an arbitrary viewpoint. We obtain the rendering from this nerve, uh, which I'm sort of calling F theta pi, which is rendering from viewpoint pi. And we just say that, okay, hey, we should train the nerve such that under the diffusion model, this nerve is giving us likely renderings. Um, and we just pass back gradients from this loss. Um, and again, this loss is basically very sort of derived from the SDS loss that Christian gave you a brief overview of. So I'll sort of skip, uh, you know, explanation of how this works. I'll just note that and in our paper, we make a couple of tiny modifications to this loss. In particular, if you have a latent space diffusion model, um, people typically use SDS loss in the latent space. We actually found it beneficial to use it sort of in the image space again, uh, because you can use other losses than L2 loss and that helps perceptual quality slightly. Uh, another one tiny detail that you should sort of look at the paper for interesting ablations is that instead of sort of a single step diffusion prediction, we use a multi-step diffusion prediction to get the Z0. Uh, and that again helps the helps improve the quality of results a bit. But essentially it's the SDS loss with a couple of tiny modifications. So I'll maybe skip the details given you saw this in the previous talk as well. But this basically gives us a way of saying, okay, we want to train an instance specific nerve such that the diffusion model, this probabilistic view prediction model that you're trained on lots and lots of data, thinks that the novel view renderings of this nerve are likely given sort of the two views of the new teddy bear that I've observed. Okay. So we, instead of a direct prediction of a 3D structure or a nerve, we now have this two stage prediction where one, we model the distribution over novel views, which sort of induces a distribution over 3D structures through renderings. And then we find a 3D mode under this induced distribution. Uh, and just to sort of give you a couple of results slightly in detail before showing you sort of a bigger montage in a bit, um, if you look at this particular example, then you can see that the leaves, et cetera, are still well preserved. And so, you know, you can integrate the measurements, but also the place where this GIF stops running, this part of the sandwich you've never seen in any of the two views. And, you know, the network, given the view synthesis model, does make a plausible guess that, okay, the bread can have some sort of a separation, continue in a reasonable way. So this particular view of the sandwich that you're seeing was not directly observed in any of the two views, and you can still make up plausible details, right? Um, and again, similarly, a different example for a hydrant where you haven't really seen its front in any detail, but you, know, you can still make plausible guesses for what this particular hydrant looks like given just these two images. Okay. And we <clears throat> sort of trained our model on the Core 3D data set and compared it to some of the standard baselines like pixel nerve, nerve pharma, view pharma, um, on sort of 10 different categories. And so these are the three prior methods that we compared to. And in comparison, sort of, EFT and VLDM are just variants of our method where VLDM just implies only using the diffusion model and not doing any 3D distillation. And our final method, which does do the distillation, you know, tells you that, okay, enforcing 3D consistency is important. Seeking this 3D mode is important. It's not enough to just model this probabilistic distribution over 2D views. You actually do need a consistent 3D mode. And, you know, the improvement from VLDM to sparse fusion sort of tells you that. Uh, but more importantly, sort of methods like pixel nerf and nerf former are these mean seeking methods and, you know, we significantly outperform them. And in particular, we outperform them in the perceptual uh, similarity metric, which actually does capture, uh, you know, something more about, okay, does this hydrant look good or close enough to the other hydrant in a perceptual space as well. Um, and I think this is an interesting ablation that further highlights this. So you can, given just two input views, we can categorize a query view based on how far it is from the closest input view. And if your query view is pretty close to the input view, then sort of all methods give you a pretty good prediction. So all these three methods, if you just look at the hydrant, give you a pretty reasonable prediction. But as you go further and further away, as you start generating uh, query views that are far away from the context view, uh, things like pixel nerf or sort of EFT, which is a transformer based regression, both of those baselines start giving you more blurry predictions, uh, these mean seeking predictions, whereas our approach, even for far away viewpoints, gives you a much more sharper result because of the sort of mode seeking behavior. Um, and sort of just to show you a montage, I think in the paper we have results over 51 categories on the Core 3D, uh, Core 3D data set. And sort of for all of them, given just a couple of images, we can get pretty reasonable uh, 3D predictions. And I think the code and models for all of these are also available if you want to sort of go play with them. Um, and okay, I think 
we do have some time. So I'll, um, that was one task where given a few posed images, we want to infer you know, the underlying 3D structure. But you know, how do we get these poses to begin with? So sort of if, if someone just takes two, three images of an object, how do we infer good poses for it? Um, and so I just want to briefly give you uh, an overview of some this line of work that we have. So the most recent paper in that line of work is RELPOS++, which is an archive, a follow-up on a paper from my lab last year called RELPOS. Um, and so sort of both of them are available with sort of code online with uh, sort of Jason and Amy being the lead on these works. But I'm sort of really excited about the system because what this can let you is just take a few images of this generic object. So both of these results that you're seeing here are just objects that we had in the lab that we just captured, captured images ourselves. And given just sort of four images of this object, which to be honest, as a human, it took me a while to understand these relative poses for, our system can pretty easily give you the relative camera configuration of these four images. And similarly for the sort of dial fly action figure, uh, given just a few images, even with sort of height variation, can pretty accurately give you the cameras for all of these. Um, and again, the task is given a few images, we want to output 60 camera poses. And uh, sort of one caveat that I want to note is to make this task well posed because there is this global coordinate ambiguity. Uh, we assume that the orientation of the first image is identity, that the rotation of the first image is identity to sort of make some things well defined. But basically given some images, you want to output these rotations and translations. And again, a regression-based approach or this direct prediction-based approach would look something like this. Given all images, we encode them, have some sort of a transformer which jointly processes them, and then just output rotations and translations. And in fact, this was the approach from which I showed you the results earlier, which didn't quite work well. Apologies, it's for a different sequence as opposed to this one, but directly regressing these poses doesn't sort of quite give you accurate results. Instead, sort of our insight, uh, originally nil pose and sort of improved a bit in this one, was that instead of directly predicting poses, let's model distributions over pairwise poses. So given these features, which have looked at multiple images, we take features from image I, image J, and give a candidate rotation and ask our network to score it. So this is an energy-based model to which we say, okay, is 30 degree rota relative rotation between these two reasonable? You know, okay, not 30 degree because it has three degrees of freedom, but we give it a candidate relative rotation and just ask it to score whether it's likely or not. And that gives us some uh, predictions like this, that given these two images, uh, you know, given the poor lighting, the network is slightly confused. It thinks of four different modes, which you know, is kind of understandable. And the open circle depicts the true relative rotation between the two. Uh, for the sandwich, it's a bit more con uh, confident. And I think this is the more interesting example where it really is a symmetric object. And the network does understand that, okay, uh, you know, one degree of freedom in the rotation is sort of really, really ambiguous. Um, I think here's just some visualization where given these two images, uh, you know, in form of a video, I'm just showing you that particularly for the symmetric object on the right, you do see this band of uncertainties, which is, you know, uh, great and expected behavior. Um, and I think one minor detail is that if you use a transformer, you can actually use context from other images as opposed to just two images. So these are distributions that you get if you only see two images to predict relative rotation between image one and two. And you improve over that if you're using a transformer, which is sort of a gain that we had from Delpose to Delpose++ plus plus system, which is incorporating multi-view reasoning can actually make you better at predicting even pairwise rotation distributions. Um, but essentially this architecture lets you model the relative rotation distribution between any two images. And then we just say, okay, let's find a global rotation. Like, let's find global rotations for each image that is most likely under this model pairwise distribution. So we just optimize for global rotations across images using this pairwise energy score. Um, and you know, maybe I'll sort of skip this part a bit, but you know, I didn't really talk about translation. It sort of turns out that if we are careful about our coordinate system, we can get away without modeling uh, the distribution over translation, but I'll sort of refer you to the paper for that. Uh, but if we are careful about choosing our coordinate system, we can actually directly regress to translation uh, with the only caveat being that we have to do some careful accounting to account for the scene scale, which is why we treat one image a bit specially, but I'll maybe skip some of those details. Um, but I think here are maybe the interesting bits, which is if we just take these seven images and run our system, it can give us pretty accurate poses, which are not too far off from what cold map can give you on these seven images. But I think, and cold map actually gives you pretty accurate poses when it works. 
but unfortunately doesn't work in most of the cases. So those were sort of two cherry picked successes for Colmap, but more often than not, given just the small number of images, it fails to converge. Whereas our method does pretty robustly give you, you know, relatively accurate poses often within 10, 15 degrees um, for just lots of generic objects. Um, and I think we have some comparison where Colmap only succeeds like 23, 25% of the time. Um, and sort of the pose regression method, which is the gray line succeeds about 50% of the time. And our method uh, for scene categories succeeds about 85%. And even for novel and scene categories succeeds about sort of 70, 75% of the time. Um, where we define success, you know, in some accuracy based on camera rotation. Um, but again, what's really, really exciting to me is that you can just take the system and just give it six images that you yourself captured. So this is, I think, the first author's mom's espresso machine at their home. Um, and it just gives you relatively good uh, camera poses. Even if you focus on this pink view, which is showing this machine from the top, you can kind of very easily understand that it didn't it accurately. Um, and again, you can point it to sort of generic objects such as this one, give it six images on my table here, and it pretty accurately gives you camera poses for all of those. And again, the code and models are available. You can even use these camera poses for some downstream reconstruction tasks. Like you can take eight images of this Baxter, get reasonably accurate camera poses. And the bottom right uh, is sort of a reconstruction that you're seeing using one of our earlier systems on 3D reconstruction combined with these poses, which then need to be optimized very, very slightly. Um, but I think taking again a step back, I talked about these two tasks, one where you want to infer 3D given a small number of views, one where you want to infer poses given a small number of um, images. But at a high level, I would say that we basically use the exact same approach for both of them. Step one is just model the distribution in the first case over novel views, in the second case over relative rotations. And then step two is just find modes, find a 3D instant NGP, which is the mode in this rendering distribution space or find global poses, which are modes in this pairwise distribution space. Um, but, you know, high level for me, at least in this line of work has been that when you have these sort of tasks for 3D inference, you should try to input distributions and not just means. And even if you care about just the single 3D output or a single consistent output, that will give you sort of huge gains. Uh, yeah, so with that, happy to wrap up and take a few questions as time permits. Thanks a lot, Shubham, for this fantastic talk. Very exciting work, great results. Um, so we have, as always, uh, a microphone here for your questions. And until we have questions popping up, I'll ask a few. So the last work that you showed, um, mm -hmm. how robust is it to, to crop to cropping? So, you know, like the images, they seem like very nicely cropped. The object is in the center. It's like fully yeah. visible. So that's a great question. So I think it is, it does require the objects to be visible. We actually are using all of these using automatically detected bounding boxes. So it is a bit robust to detection errors that you would normally see. So we take images, we do automatic detection in some way, or you know, you can give us an approximate bounding box and it just uses that. You don't need to be very precise. Again, a lot of these self-captured results, we've just done it ourselves. It takes you 30 seconds to annotate a course bounding box and it just works with that. But if this would be like partially occluded, uh, yeah, so I, uh, would that be an issue? I think we might need to train our system with a bit more variation, and then I would expect it to work. Right now, we just didn't train it that way. Okay, got it, got it. Any questions for the audience? Else, I would ask one more question. So, uh, the work that you showed earlier, where you're using this uh, kind of a little bit more advanced SDS loss. Mm -hmm. There you're kind of relying on the fact that the diffusion model somehow is able to complete the novel view, right? So in your sandwich, yeah, exactly this kind of sandwich yeah. slide. Then yeah. it worked very well, right? But what about, I mean, we heard about biases on stable diffusion where, you know, it's kind of trying to, it's actually not, not used to see certain views of an object, like whatever, like a cow from the top or something like this? Would, would yeah, I think that's a great question. And I didn't go too much into sort of the training details of this, but we do train this model from scratch using this novel view data. So it has actually seen novel view data. So it does know that, okay, these are, it has developed novel view priors as opposed to single view priors, which stable diffusion has. Got it. So this model is trained on 3D data set. 
Okay, that makes sense. So final chance for you guys to and girls to have a question. Okay, yeah, we actually have one over there. And then we are going to close the session after that question. Hi. Uh, thank you for your great talk. So I just have one question regarding the quality of the result that we see here. I mean, mm -hmm. if you notice, the, actually the result is still lack the sharpness as we have those two mm -hmm. sparse views. Yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering what's kind of the limitation here. Is like the, we need to learn better that kind of diffusion prior or the... I don't know if you have more input images, we get a better quality or or that. Yeah, so I mean, I think both of your observations are correct. So given more images, quality does improve, but I would expect that even given these two views, we should be able to get better results with slightly better diffusion models. I think since we did this work, other people have, instead of training model from scratch, for instance, zero, one, two, three, essentially has a similar idea, but trains the model from an existing stable diffusion model, and that can improve the quality slightly. So. You know, instead of training this diffusion model from scratch, if you can initialize it from a stable diffusion one, you should expect these to improve a bit. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So with this, we are going to close the session here. Thanks a lot, Shubham, yeah. for Thanks, being here. And yeah, fantastic talk. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Yeah. Okay, so and with this, we are also closing the Zoom for today. Uh, the panel discussion that we're going to have will, will not be broadcasted. Uh, very sorry for that, but we don't kind of have the setting here. So yeah, thanks everyone for showing up online and yep, see you these days. <laughs>